order to create great public spaces and adapt our community in a really organic way. I'll just hand over to David now. Thanks. Um, so first the advertisement before I forget. Um, we've got some copies of Mental Speed Bumps uh, at the back. Uh, they're $30 or whatever you can afford. I'm going to introduce you to the notion of placemaking. Placemaking means different things to different people, but I find it a very useful concept to think holistically about our public spaces. Now, I define placemaking as being like homemaking. In homemaking, you take a house and you turn it into a home. In placemaking, you take a space, a public space, and you turn it into a place. Placemaking is really homemaking extended into the public realm. So can I start by asking you to think about a house where when you walk through the front door or the back door or climb through the window, however you want to get in, you instantly feel at home in that space. I've done this exercise with thousands of planners, engineers, all sorts of people. I have never yet had an audience, anybody in any audience say that the homemaker has employed a very expensive interior designer. <laughs> in fact, let's do a test here. How many like a little bit of chaos and mess in the space? <laughs> Who like absolutely pristine order? <laughs> okay, uh, the therapist is up the back there. <laughs> you can buy a house with money, but you can never buy a home with money. So it is not about the physicality of the space, it is what we as human beings bring to that space which make it feel homely, that make us feel at home. We put our feet up on the coffee table, we say we are what? Making ourselves at home. And until people make themselves at home and use a space in a way that the designer probably didn't intend, then they really haven't made themselves at home. One of the Fascinating things I discovered when I started uh, going around the world and looking at great public spaces is how often they actually broke design rules. In fact, I would argue that if you want a point of difference in your town, you automatically have to break design rules. Otherwise, you'll be like every other place. Inside of a house, you have two different types of space. You have exchange space, which is your rooms, and you have movement space, which is hallways. Okay, now how many people here, when you go hunting for a house, say to the estate agent or the architect, please find me a house with maximum number of hallways. I'm in love with hallways. <laughs> The business of, uh, of being in a house is what happens in the rooms, not what happens in the hallways. Yet in our culture, for a whole lot of reasons, we are besotted with movement and whenever we do the design of a public space, even pedestrian space is focused on movement. We have to stop thinking about the streets as corridors and we have to think about them as rooms. Uh, the way that an architect reduces the amount of corridors in a space is they create what? They create dual purpose space. In other words, they knock the wall down and they have a room that can be used either as a corridor or as a room. The most important exchanges in any city are the ones that aren't planned, the spontaneous ones. They are the core of the resilience of your community, the creative life of your community, the economic life of your community, the social justice of your community, etc. Let me give you one example. Elderly people used to sit out in the public realm and we would go along and swap stories with them. That was a spontaneous form of exchange. If that is not allowed, what do we do? We build them a senior citizen's hall, we buy them a senior citizen's bus, we bus them off to the senior citizen's hall where they can knit doilies together. A planned exchange replacing a lost spontaneous exchange and you can see that the social values are totally and utterly different. So we have to focus on what, what is the infrastructure in the public domain that is facilitating these spontaneous exchanges. 
Uh, and here's a simple example. This is just the example of storytelling. These seats are arranged in a way so that when people walk past, people can watch them make up stories in their head like, how the hell did she end up with him? <laughs> Somebody takes twice as long to walk from one end of the street to the other end of the street, you've now made the street look twice as full of people. Some of you have got thinking about this. <laughs> The first secret of public spaces is to slow people down as they move through the space. Now, some simple lessons that come from this. The first is the notion of the anchoring presence. So the first thing you need to look at when you're uh, looking at vi revitalising a public space are who are the anchoring presences or how do we encourage anchoring presences because they are the people who add the most value to your public space. All of the things that you think are your biggest problem in public space are potentially your biggest asset. And the youth gang that has colonised the space is your greatest asset. All the homeless people in the public space are your greatest asset. Whenever, you, whenever people say that such and such a group of people are, are a problem in public <coughs> space, I always say it is not they that are the problem, it is who is missing from this space that is the problem. Weeds only colonise a piece of land if the land has become degraded and they are actually there to play a significant role, which is to re-fertilise the soil. And in a similar way, public spaces that have been taken over by any group of people, the problem is that that public space is in trouble already and it's about how do you bring back the balance into that space without getting rid of those people. If people are going to have spontaneous exchanges and slow down, there have got to be reasons why they are slowing down. And it's the simple things. Look at these seats in, in Austria. <coughs> Every kid wants to climb up here and walk around the back of it. You know, it's just in the way that you do things. We're not purposely putting in special made play equipment or whatever. It's just the way you do things seduce people into slowing down and participating in the space. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment you've got a party happening at your house, the lounge room's jam-packed full of people, the party's going off like a, an absolute bomb, and five of your neighbours who are at the party say, can we borrow ten guests each because we would love to have a party like this at our house. <laughs> what happens to your party? It's dead. You've just killed it. The biggest mistake cities make in trying to animate public space is they spread their party too thin. The last thing you will ever want to do is pedestrianise an area and throw all the cars out because instantly you have to find about 200 times more activity to just make that space function. You've just killed the party, potentially. You only ever pedestrianise when the party is going so well that you absolutely have to have that extra space to spread the party. If you pedestrianise to make the party, you're in deep trouble. The other huge mistake that is constantly made in animating public space is people instantly go for the big picture, the big project, the big sculpture or whatever happens to be, the big makeover. Here's an example of how uh, we thought micro in Wodonga. Uh, we did have 150,000 allocated for a sculpture by a famous sculptor. It's just so our town can say that we've got so and so sculpture in our street, you know, uh, which would mean something to, to somebody, but I said, What does it mean to a four year old kid? So we took that same money and instead created a trail of what we call lost while lounging. These were things that people had left behind in the street when they got too relaxed. Some of these things were hidden under seats so kids would go along and they'd be looking under seats. You could see it wasn't pretentious. It was just very homely and it was very micro level. We did all of this in-house. We did employ a famous artist to do this. It was all done uh, in-house. I think the thing that has killed public space more than anything else is the city's move from a from a uh, citizen based or a civility based to what is now called a customer base. In other words, residents are treated as customers who pay the, their rates and in exchange they expect the city to provide
provide everything they need for city living. We have to find a way of going back to the civility model, back to the citizen model and away from the customer model because cities by their very definition are a cooperative enterprise which cannot be run on a customer basis. Let me say that every single person sitting in this room has a responsibility for the way that your streets in Fremantle work, whether they are great places or not great places. The simple thing of whether you smile at somebody and say hello is part of building this micro level diversity, it's part of the experience envelope that people are having. One of the things that I talk about with cities is going back to an incremental approach to creating space rather than a master planning approach. The moment you master plan a space, you are in deep trouble. What can you do today? What can you do tomorrow that will instantly start making a, a change in the space? Don't sit around drawing up fancy plans. Think about what is the small thing that you can do that can make a difference. The, the most revolutionary thing any city council can do, in my opinion, is to set up a cross-departmental red tape reduction group with a goal of reducing your council's red tape by 2% a year. That is the most important place-making thing you can ever do in your city. You don't need to do a single thing out there in the actual physical realm. Because what you're doing is you're starting to establish this model of giving the power back to the citizens to, to own the space and to use the space.